Welcome to the Federalist Society's virtual event. This afternoon, October 1st, we discuss redistricting, the John R. Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act. My name is Evelyn Hildebrand, and I'm an Associate Director of Practice Groups at the Federalist Society. As always, please note that all expressions of opinion are those of the experts on today's call. Today, we are fortunate to have with us some very distinguished speakers. I'll introduce our moderator, Maya Naranja, who will then introduce our speakers. Maya is a visiting fellow at the Independent Women's Law Center, and she's also a member of the Federalist Society's Free Speech and Election Law Practice Group. Maya was formerly the Acting Chief of Staff and Principal Advisor to the Commissioner for the Administration for Children and Families at HHS, and Senior Advisor to the Director of the Office for Civil Rights within the Office of the Secretary. We're very pleased that she could join us to moderate this afternoon. After our speakers give their opening remarks, we will turn to audience questions, time permitting, if you have a question, please enter it into the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. With that, thank you for being with us today. Maya, the floor is yours. Thank you, Evelyn, and thank you to the Federal Society for uh, hosting this panel. Um, I'm delighted to welcome these two amazing in, uh, redistricting experts who have uh, dealt with the issue for multiple cycles. So um, we have first um, Professor Jeffrey Weiss, who um, is at the New York University Law School as a adjunct, New York Law School, adjunct professor of law and uh, senior fellow and director of their Census and Redistricting Institute. And second on the panel, we have Mark Braden, who is of counsel at Baker Hostetler. So without further ado, Professor Weiss. Well, thank you very much, uh, Maya. It's a pleasure to uh, share this program with Mark Braden, who is a longtime friend and associate of mine. Uh, we may come from different um, political or philosophical backgrounds, but for many years have been able to work together uh, for the common interest of uh, pursuing uh, fair redistricting uh, policies, maps across the country, and enforcing the Voting Rights Act uh, however you might look at it. Uh, what I'll do to uh, start is to give a brief overview of HR4, uh, the John R. Lewis uh, Voting Rights Advancement Act, which uh, passed the House of Representatives earlier this year and is now pending before the U.S. Senate, as is S1, uh, a bill that uh, does a lot more in terms of election reform. Uh, so both bills' fates are before the U.S. Senate, where given everything else from debt ceiling to the budget to infrastructure, uh, it's hard to say what will happen. Um, but we can say that uh, this now being October 1st, many states are in the, in the throes of redistricting of their congressional and state legislative districts. Uh, in fact, Oregon and Maine have completed their processes and I believe Nebraska is about to uh, complete things there as well. Many other states will enact their own plans later this year, and some will enact plans as late as 2022. Uh, but the bottom line is that at the state end, new congressional and state legislative lines need to be in place before the 2022 elections, given the Supreme Court's mandate under uh, one person, one vote population equality, that lines be redrawn once every 10 years, generally after the federal decennial census, which was delayed due to the pandemic and getting the data to the states. Uh, but states are on track now, albeit being a bit late. Uh, the, the John R. Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act would restore uh, and strengthen the uh, right to vote by making sure that any changes to voting rules that could discriminate against voters based on race or background are federally reviewed before they could be implemented by state or local governments. Uh, the bill would restore the essential portions of the Voting Rights Act uh, that block discriminatory voting practices before they go into effect, putting a transparent process in place for protecting everyone's right to vote. Uh, in 2013, the US Supreme Court vacated section four of the Voting Rights Act, which served as the trigger for section five of the Voting Rights Act. Uh, section five is still good law. That was enacted by Congress in 1965 and uh, requires that 
uh, for a certain number of uh, so-called covered jurisdictions, uh, states and localities with a history of racially discriminatory voting practices that any um, law, practice, or procedure needed to be pre-cleared or pre-approved by either the federal uh, district court in Washington, D.C., a, a special federal district court in Washington, D.C., made up of three judges, uh, or by the U.S. Justice Department. Uh, Section 5 was triggered by Section 4, which included a formula enacted in the 1960s and amended in the early 1970s that based coverage on whether a state had discriminatory practices uh, for uh, uh, language or, uh, uh, requirements or poll tax, uh, also where you had less than half of the voters in a county or state uh, voting in the 1964 presidential election. And in the case that was brought up to the Supreme Court, uh, Shelby versus Holder, uh, the Supreme Court held in an opinion by, <coughs> excuse me, just Chief Justice Roberts, that you could not apply a 1960s formula using vote numbers from <coughs> 50 years ago in the context of post-2010 uh, reality. So they vacated and set aside, rejected the trigger formula in uh, section four. <coughs> you teach all day yesterday, your voice hasn't, hasn't quite come back. So uh, we don't have the trigger uh, in place now for section five and the bill in Congress, HR4, would essentially do that. And it's trying to do that at this point in history where a number of states have enacted laws that are, are being seen as erecting barriers uh, to uh, the ballot box for millions of Americans. Uh, I think in this past year, there've been over 400 pieces of legislation introduced and uh, 30 laws enacted by states that would have needed for the most part to have been pre-cleared uh, by the Justice Department or a federal court before they could be implemented. Uh, some states in fact enacted uh, voter suppression laws right after the, Shel the Shelby case came down. And now it's been uh, seven years without Section 5 enforcement. Uh, the Voting Rights Act has historically had uh, a, his a long record of bipartisan support. Um, every time the Voting Rights Act has been reauthorized, uh, it's been signed into law by a Republican president after first being approved by President Lyndon Johnson during uh, 1965 at the height of the Civil Rights Movement. When the Voting Rights Act was last uh, reauthorized in 2006, <clears throat> it passed the U.S. Senate with a unanimous vote of 98 to nothing. Uh, and it's, uh, it's uh, my hope that in the U.S. Senate, uh, there will be bipartisan support for whatever kinds of bill um, they can pass. But that's still something that's a, a work in progress. Uh, Section 5, up until 2013, had a specific formula that the Supreme Court rejected, as I had mentioned. So what HR 4 does is rewrites the trigger formula, uh, creating a new structure. And in a nutshell, what HR 4 would do would be to give the Attorney General of the United States the authority to request federal election observers if there are serious threats of discrimination. Uh, the bill also adds uh, new triggers uh, for violations of the Voting Rights Act, including a new formula that would address current discrimination tactics when evaluating a state or locality's history of voter discrimination. In particular, uh, these voting rights uh, violations that we require uh, a federal court or the Justice Department to review uh, a new law would include jurisdictions or states that have 15 or more voting rights violations in the last 25 years, or any state with 10 or more Voting Rights Act violations and at least one state committed voting rights violation within the past 25 years, as well as 
impact any subdivision, a state or a local government uh, with three or more Voting Rights Act violations in the last 25 years. Uh, the bill also would require states and localities to be more transparent uh, by, requ by requiring that more public notice be provided when changes are being proposed for voting policies or laws and require that all voting changes be announced at least 180 days prior to an election. Uh, the bill would also require federal approval for policies that impact the ability uh, to register to vote or to cast a ballot, and also provides for new language that allows for administrative bailout from coverage from Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act, where the Attorney General would be asked to determine if any political subdivision of a state would be eligible for exemption from preclearance requirements. Uh, after the Voting Rights Act was first enacted in 1965, it was challenged. Uh, specifically, uh, South Carolina, in a case of Katzenbeck, uh, uh, South Carolina versus Katzenbeck, challenged the ability of the federal government to create, uh, enact the Voting Rights Act. Uh, the Supreme Court held in that case that the um, Constitution permitted the Congress to enact laws that would um, uh, uh, send federal examiners to oversee voter registration, as well as uh, to provide for advanced federal approval of proposed changes to voting regulations, laws, uh, which of course includes redistricting plans. Uh, the court held that the Voting Rights Act uh, was permitted under the scope of power given to the Congress by the 15th Amendment, which was enacted uh, I think in 1870, after the Civil War, that allowed Congress to employ any rational means to abolish state laws that promote racial discrimination in election procedures. Uh, the uh, Section 5 um, effort was used for redistricting uh, review uh, from the 60s all the way through the, the 2000, uh, 2010 uh, redistricting cycles. And now that we're underway now, there is no preclearance policy. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of my talk, you know, states are already underway. Um, although Maine and Oregon were not uh, states that fell under preclearance in the past, both governors in those states have already approved their plans. Had those states been under, uh, uh, under preclearance before, they would then have 60 days to obtain, well, once they submit the plan to the federal uh, justice department, the justice department would have had 60 days um, in which to approve or reject the plan. But until that approval had been granted, uh, the plans could not go into effect. Uh, and that provided for a valuable tool for uh, those who objected to plans because they, you couldn't use the plans. Unlike now, if you're challenging a racially discriminatory uh, redistricting plan under either Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act, which prohibits minority vote dilution, or uh, under the 14th Amendment, which bans racial gerrymandering or the packing of too many minority voters into a district, a federal litigation could take uh, at least two years. And during that time, uh, the, the plan that is being challenged would be used in the next election for the most part. Stays could be issued against them, but you know, generally those plans could be used on an interim basis. It always depends on the timeline, the facts of the situation, and when the next election you know, is occurring. So I hope that provides just an overview of uh, HR 4, uh, what it seeks to do, what it does, uh, where things have been, and now that we're are, we're in October, you know, where things might be going. So thank you. Thank you, Professor Weiss. Uh, Mr. Braden. Hi, it's a pleasure to be with Jeff. We've known each other and have been involved in redistricting voting issues for a long time. I had different color hair. I think Jeff had more hair, as I remember. <laughs> <laughs> but leaving aside that, I, you know, HR4 and H1, the, the HR4 being the voting rights bill and H.R. 1 being the general election bill. 
are in response to what is alleged to be an election crisis that we're in. And I would suggest to you that in fact, we don't have an election administration crisis. We might have a crisis of confidence in our system, but we don't have an election administration crisis. Our elections are generally well run in this country. The winners almost always are certified the winners of the election. There's no real indication of massive fraud. There's no real in indication of suppression of minorities to any reasonable degree across the country. Uh, sure, there's miss and mal administration of elections on occasion and fraud does occasionally happen, but these are all incidental issues. They are not major issues. So the last election should not have triggered anything resembling an election crisis, which of course is totally different than in 2000. In 2000, the Bush v. Gore race was genuinely in doubt following the election. And there are two states in which you really frankly had to do a recount to have any reason to believe that the election night numbers and the certifications that would be coming from those election night numbers in the more formal canvas process were in fact accurate. And so that was a genuine crisis. And in response to that genuine crisis, we have the Help America Vote Bill passed by overwhelming bipartisan support, virtually unanimous in both parties, dealing with real issues identified in the Bush v. Gore recount. There were real problems with election administration, real problems with old antiquated election counting casting systems that simply didn't work well enough uh, for the 21st century. So those were real crises. We can and should point out, and I will point out that we now have a crisis of confidence in the system. Whether that's fair or not, I doubt that it's fair. Uh, I think it's fair though to point to the former president as being the person who's the arsonist who start to, started the fire of a lack of confidence in our system. But unfortunately, the proposals in Congress right now from the, from the Democratic leadership, the firemen dealing with that crisis, neither of these bills is any type of genuine effort to have bipartisan support for the changes. And they simply are firemen showing up at the fire of confidence uh, with gasoline rather than water. When the Voting Rights Act was passed in 1965, it arguably was one of the single most important pieces of legislation in the 20th century. It fundamentally changed in combination with the one person, one vote revolution in the Supreme Court in the mid 60s too, fundamentally changed American politics. It fundamentally changed the whole concept of American politics. It, American politics prior to that was a one party, one race, in a significant portion of our country. The Voting Rights Act blew that up. The Voting Rights Act, like the Help America Vote Act, was a bipartisan enactment. Lyndon Johnson deserves tremendous credit for his legislative achievement. But of course, that is a broader group of, of folks involved. You've got Martin Luther King, TVs, the Selma heroes, marching for registration are all important. But in the actual chamber itself, it's important to point out Lyndon Johnson was very clear and expressed it to any number of people that the bill had to be bipartisan and Everett Dirksen had to agree to the bill and had to bring along a majority of the Republican members in the Senate. It was a bipartisan bill with Dirksen directly involved. The renewals of the bill in 82, Dole was one of the clear players in enacting the bill, the renewal. Bush signed the renewal, the Republican leadership in the House and Senate were in favor of it. They were bipartisan efforts. Bipartisan is in fact the, the only approach that you can deal with election law changes where you can help bank the fire of our present lack of confidence 
in some areas on, on the process. But that's not what we're looking at here. We're looking at a process that would fundamentally move most of election administration, which is principally at state and local levels, into a much more regulated federal process. And that is, in my opinion, fundamentally a mistake. Our process works pretty well, not perfect. We have a system that was not designed by God nor administered by angels, but on the whole, it actually works pretty well. I have no reason to believe the approaches we're talking about here would in fact instill more confidence or make for a better system. This system works pretty well, and we're looking at changes that are not being adopted in a serious bipartisan effort. Describing the changes in the law in the last year at the local level as a return to Jim Crow is ridiculous, as I think any fair-minded person really looking at what Jim Crow was like in the process then would recognize. Now, reasonable minds can disagree on any of these changes. You can, you can argue whether or not voter ID is good or bad, and there are points to be made on both sides. But the reality is a huge percentage of the electorate, Democrat, Republican, white and black, view voter ID laws as being reasonable, reasonable effort at protecting the system. Again, this process we're looking at in both the House bill, um, election law bill, and the voting rights bill is not a genuine effort, in my opinion, to improve the system, but is an effort that would result in a lack of confidence in a system that's already shaken. Now, the process of shaking the system, the confidence of people in the system, may have been unfair, but we are where we are. And so what Congress should be doing and should be looking forward is if we need to make changes, it needs to be something coming from both parties. We need to recognize that there are a lack of confidence in a significant portion of the electorate out there, and we need to do confidence. What's important in elections, a vital importance in elections, more important than anything else, is that the winners win, and equally important, that the rational supporters of the losers believe they lost. Everything else is secondary to those two points. And I do not see in any of these changes efforts to address those concerns, but efforts that in many ways look like uh, trying to garner political advantage through legislative process and or the litigation process. I hate to be so contrarian, but this just simply is incredibly mishandled. If there's a genuine effort to deal with genuine issues, I'm wildly in favor of that. But this effort to nationalize the system through simply we're in power now and we can do it is simply a, a mistake. Thank you, Mr. Brady. Um, you both have raised uh, a lot of legal um, issues um, that are relevant for this cycle. Um, so I want to uh, ask what is different about this cycle versus prior cycles? in terms of um, advising states, drawing maps right now, um, you know, complying with the law when there, you know, litigation is, is anticipated and, uh, you know, potentially new legislation being passed. Well, I think well, we'll start with, I yeah. can agree on the notion that the general voting rights, racial jurisprudence had become significantly less clear. There is a good deal of tension between the creation of majority minority districts under sec pursuant to the Jingles case in section two of the voting rights and how you identify racial gerrymanders which violate the 14th amendment. You've got competing notions as to how you should draw lines. We have some states now who are drawing lines uh, without using racial data. 
uh, because they're afraid of, part of racial gerrymandering claims. And they feel the best way to avoid those is by not using racial data whatsoever. That, of course, does raise the question of how do you sh show that you complied with Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act, as outlined in Thornburg versus Jingles, uh, without looking at racial data? And that's an interesting question. I'm not sure I have an answer for it. Yeah. Professor Weiss. I, I would, well, would you my, my basic advice to uh, legislators of both parties is that the redistricting process needs to be fairer, more transparent, and more participatory to allow the public to weigh in um, to a greater extent than it has in the past. You know, this used to be a totally backroom process, you know, the prover in the proverbial smoke-filled room that no one really understood. In fact, people look at the word redistricting with negative connotations that re must mean something we don't want to know about, and they don't really understand the process. But when we explain that redistricting gets down to who represents you in Washington, the state capitol, and the local governments, who, uh, you know, uh, enacts the laws that impact your hospitals, your schools, your streets. You look outside the window, everything you see that's funded by government is driven by who represents you and the quality of services that they deliver. That's why redistricting is so important. If you can begin engaging the public uh, and if the legislators also uh, have a more transparent public process, everybody benefits. What I don't want to see uh, our redistricting plans uh, you know, announced uh, overnight with no public input, uh, passed without much debate the next day and signed into law. We've seen that happen in a number of states, especially after 2010. And that led to a public outcry against letting politicians pick their voters instead, uh, let the voters pick their politicians. And we've seen in Utah, Colorado, Michigan, Virginia, uh, New York, uh, uh, California, Arizona, uh, new commissions created that ostensibly take away the power from the elected officials to draw the districts and try to uh, have the, the plans developed by bipartisan or nonpartisan groups. Now, those commission efforts to some degree have been successful and some not successful. The jury is still out on that. But when it comes to the specific advice on, on the Voting Rights Act and on districting uh, in minority communities, the mark is correct. I agree that the uh, there's still debate, it's unsettled. My advice generally is that you should use uh, racial data if you use it the right way. You need to be mindful not to uh, dilute minority voting strength. That's where section two of the Voting Rights Act comes in, that you don't want to crack the minority community into fewer districts where they cannot elect their preferred candidate of choice, where you have significantly high levels of racially polarized voting. Uh, on the other hand, you also want to avoid 14th Amendment racial gerrymandering packing problems where you unnecessarily put too many minority residents into a district that wastes their ability or denies them the, the, uh, the chance to impact elections in neighboring districts. Uh, I think there is a difference that could be understood. Uh, a key thing though is that redistricting authorities need to employ something called racial block voting analysis before they enact a plan. Um, that involves using a political scientist skills to run various kinds of numbers from the last 10 years of primaries and election results to see how the white voters and the Asian or black or Hispanic voters vote and whether the white majority denies the, the minority the ability to elect a candidate at certain specific levels. There's no one size fits all. But you need to you know, uh, employ that kind of methodology so you know you're informed on what to do or not to do. Uh, since 2000, you know, the Supreme Court has looked at districts being created uh, not for racial purposes, but for partisan purposes. 
And uh, the North Carolina was in court from 1990 until 2001 over its 1990 plan uh, litigated after the next census was taken. Uh, but the Supreme Court finally said in a challenge to an infamous uh, interstate highway shaped district that uh, race wasn't involved, politics was, and that's okay. Essentially passing the buck on it, but uh, you know, the bottom line still is that race does matter. You can't go overboard, but you also have to be mindful of not diluting racial voting strength either, where you have high levels of polarization. That's an important point to make, that you have to have uh, these kinds of tests done so you know what you're doing. Most Many states have not done this prior to enacting their plans in, in recent years. I think they will now. So the Fowler Society wants to open this up uh, to Q&A. So as uh, the um, individuals on the webinar um, start submitting questions, uh, let's continue the discussion. Um, so the uh, John R. Lewis um, Voting Rights Advancement Act, um, it, it differs from the existing um, Voting Rights Act because it doesn't have um, retrogression. Um, comparing it to, you know, the, the elements of um, discrimination um, earlier from the, the time. And that was what uh, the Supreme Court um, found problematic with the preclearance formula. So what are the, the positive or negative um, uh, aspects of changing preclearance to relate to decisions or litigation or the attorney general in developing a formula? Well, the, uh, the language of the bill includes uh, several kinds of violations, whether it's a Section 2 Voting Rights Act violation, whether it's a language minority, I think it's Section 203 of the Voting Rights Act. Um, if, if, a, uh, if a jurisdiction um, exhibits a number of so-called voting rights violations, that there have been basically bad actors vis-a-vis -a, -vis a determination of a state or federal court or the Justice Department, and you tally those up, that if a state is, uh, demonstrates a bad record with minority voters, then it would be uh, covered under the new Section 5 trigger that H.R. 4 creates. Uh, Mr. Braden, what would be a uh, bipartisan sort of new formula? if uh, you said that there, there aren't bipartisan uh, measures in HR4 and it, in the House side, it was um, uh, the votes were on party lines. Yeah, and, and it, sure, there you could certainly make changes in the Voting Rights Act that would garner uh, bipartisan support. Uh, any type of preclearance provision, except in very, very narrow circumstances strikes me as unlikely to generate bipartisan support, because it's it's really this is a good observation with the Federalist Society. It's obviously a Federalist issue, the notion of where the locus of most election control should be, whether at the local level or at the national level. At the national level, in a crisis situation, in which we had in 1965, we had a crisis situation. Now it's a long-term crisis. It was a crisis of denying African-Americans the right to vote from the end of Reconstruction to a large degree up until the passage of the 65. But we don't have that crisis situation right now. And the notion that the local jurisdictions are not the best decision makers on this and that somehow there's a better location in the District of Columbia for this decision making strikes me as unwise. The, the, and this is not just decision-making on election administration. This is also decision-making on drawing legislative plans. Draw, you know, we, Jeff and I share the view that we ought to have fair plans. But like beauty, one's definition of fairness is often dependent upon one's point of view, which way your feet are pointing. So we, you know, fairness concepts are tricky to deal with. Uh, and we start out with a system that's a geographically based system rather than a list system. If your definition of fairness is some type of proportionality, then we would be, we would need a list system like 
Italy or France or some component of a list system where we get, we could come up with something resembling more closely proportional representation. We have a geographically based system, which by its very nature are going to come up with plans and results which do not reflect proportionality, either partisan or racially based because of different residential patterns. So we have decided on that system. There are uh, thousands of pages from hundreds of different political scientists arguing the different points of view, but we have a long-term commitment in this country to geographically based systems. And to some degree, if you're gonna define fairness simply as proportionality, that's going to present problems because our system won't end up there no matter who's controlling it. If I could just add, what we don't want to see is a return to the situation we had up until 1965. Uh, one of the, uh, the tenets of Section 5 preclearance was the rule against retrogression that you had to maintain for redistricting purposes the same number of uh, districts in your new plan that you had in the old plan, that you not retrogress. So I know that in, in Texas, uh, draft plans are now circulating where uh, allegedly minority districts might be eliminated or weakened. And if that's the case, have, had Section 5 been in, in effect, those plans could not have been used. It was a very basic um, you know, a rule of thumb that you had to have simply the same number of districts in your new plan as the old plan. Uh, so we wouldn't want to see a situation in, uh, in Texas, let's say, where minority districts, if they're still effectively electing the preferred candidate of choice of the minority community, uh, is eliminated. So we need to be careful there. Uh, we don't want to see laws, again, I'll mention Texas, where uh, Harris County with a predominant minority uh, voting bloc is denied the right to vote certain hours on a Sunday or to cut back on the number of drop-off boxes uh, where people can cast their ballots, uh, all the kinds of topics that come up in the bills before states today. We have a question. Um, there are, are a lot of uh, statistical analysis, um, you know, and using the census, uh, having computers to computerize it, to, to develop a algorithm for compactness and communities. Um, to take out the human element, would that be an effective way to draw districts um, and not have consideration of race or, or comply with the law? Uh, no, in my opinion. I've, I've not seen anything uh, that would make sense. Uh, certainly, computer analysis statistics are appropriate to help you analyze plans. Uh, although uh, I'm a firm believer in the cliche that there are, are lies, damn lies, and then there's statistics. Uh, great deal of this litigation uh, involves statistics which are often misleading, and anyone involved in it uh, realizes the limitations of some of our statistical analysis. And frankly, it's becoming clearer to some of the political scientists that some of our traditional methods we've used trying to identify polarized voting and, and are subject to some, some doubts. So it, they are, these are useful tools, but you want judgment. You, you, you want judgment. I, I'll use Virginia, uh, where, the, where the congressional plan was declared a, 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 a racial gerrymander. And Bernie Grothman, probably one of the best known consultants and uh, experts in this area was hired to be the master to redraw the plan and he redrew the plan and as which was the intention of the litigation be candid I, I, uh, it uh, changed the makeup and created another seat for for the Democrats in Virginia it had the effect though of removing a Republican member who would have in the next Congress likely have been the chairman of the Armed Services Committee, and that Republican member represented Norfolk. I would suggest to you a plan drawn by any Virginia politician might have, if it had been a Democratic politician, might have 
have changed the delegation that came out the way the litigation came out with an additional Democratic seat. But they would not have thought it was a good idea to get rid of the person who was going to be either the ranking member or chairman of the Armed Services Committee who was representing Norfolk. In case there's anybody here who doesn't know what Norfolk is, it's a location of the largest military installation in the United States. That's the lifeblood of the Norfolk economy. It was brain dead politically. Bernie was exactly right if you look at the statistics and you say, and that made, made sense to a political scientist from California and the numbers all work. It just was politically a huge mistake. And so you want politicians involved. You don't want this to be done by a computer. The notion, I, I've heard this repeat and repeat of, we don't want the politicians uh, choosing their voters. I totally agree with that in, in a sense, but we also don't want the computers to decide who has the seats. Paying some deference to incumbent members makes sense. Let them be voted out of office. Don't draw them out of office. But if you're gonna use a computer to do this and you're not taking incumbency into consideration and preserving core subdivisions, you're gonna be removing by the line drawing process people from Congress who were elected to Congress. And I'm not sure that's the process we want. I'm also a firm believer that uh, there is a human, there needs to be the human element to redistricting that people are in trees, as Chief Justice Earl Warren once wrote in a major redistricting opinion, that redistricting plans need to reflect where people live, how they live, what they do, that there's a, uh, a big mosaic to this process. Uh, the problem develops, however, when partisan gerrymandering goes too far, uh, algorithms, mathematicians have become more involved recently in a way that when a court is presented with a challenge and they're trying, and judges don't like to get involved in redistricting, but they have to. But to make it easier for them, uh, political scientists and, and more recently mathematicians have developed theories that they um, run thousands, I mean, I'm told thousands of iterations of a state house or congressional plan. You, you don't really need to do that if you draw the human part of it first the right way. And what judges end up doing is having to look at um, third party analyses done by computers to then score plans and which, which is the most compact, which is the least contiguous, which is the most competitive district. And there are scores and scores of ways to do this, but you, know, you still need to have the human element. Uh, a note on incumbency, because uh, this has become a, a buzzword now that you don't want to, to consider incumbency anywhere in the redistricting process. In fact, the Virginia Commission that's now drawing state legislative and congressional lines, it's a bipartisan commission of eight Republicans, eight Democrats agreed not to uh, factor in incumbency or the home addresses of the current legislators in their line drawing. And uh, they've hired two sets of uh, line drawers, one Democratic, one Republican, and the plans come back to the commission. And you know, lo and behold, all these incumbents are being paired. Well, then they realize this, public comment comes and, oh, we can't do this, we can't do that. And in uh, Northern Virginia, a few days ago, one district comes back, it was rather compact, rather like a shaped like a fist, but there was a little appendage sticking out. That's because they put the precinct of where the incumbent who represented most of that district um, lived back into the district. But the something to be said for incumbency is Mark mentioned that whether you like it or not, uh, most or well, the Congress and most state legislatures um, follow the uh, you know the, the seniority system where having been there longer periods of time, you build up seniority, you get committee chairmanships, chairpersonships, you, uh, move up the ladder and deliver funding and programs for your districts. Uh, without that, um, without those kinds of people remaining in office, you, you might get 
what you want, but not get what you need. I, I always use the example of Ohio. Uh, we ha I was involved in some litigation the last cycle in Ohio, and some of the proposed remedial plans would likely have removed John Boehner, at that time the Speaker of the House, from the House of Representatives. No one in Ohio who was actually involved in the political process, involved in running anything, involved in getting money from the federal government, would think that was good for the citizens of the state of Ohio. Doesn't matter what, how you feel partisanly, what you thought about John Boehner. Be, having the member, the speaker of the house, being from your state is incredibly advantageous to the state. So the notion that you wouldn't consider that in the process, but use some type of computer that would ignore that strikes me as brain dead. So Professor Weiss, they, um, we have a question about um, your comment about um, uh, racial minor majorities and minorities. Um, th th this person says that census projections show that um, the white population will become less than 50% of the population in the next um, one to two decades. So if the majority is the minority and the minority is the majority, how do, how do you draw districts and you know, deal with population changes? I think there we're looking at macro numbers that the white uh, population is shrinking writ large nationally or in, in states, but districting is done on a local specific basis. So you have to look at the numbers on the ground where you are that uh, you, you can also have situations where, uh, and this is something I, I've seen in New York City years back, that you might have a minority white population in an area, majority black or Hispanic population, but the white voters who might be older turn out in numbers a lot greater than the minority voters do. And that could result in a minority vote dilution situation if the white vote is stronger and the minority vote is weaker. That's just one example. But outside of that, looking at the 2020 census numbers generally, you have to look at the numbers on a district by district basis. It's, it, these issues are always very local. The, uh, the, oh, the black community in most areas of the country is fairly monolithic democratic. Uh, the Hispanic community and Asian communities, those should both be plural, is not. There are significant differences between uh, Latinos who have a background of coming from Mexico than those coming from Cuba, than those coming from Central America. And they tend not necessarily to be aligned politically uh, the, in Asians, uh, certainly there are Asian groups that are very democratic, but there are Asian groups, as an example, Filipinos, uh, who are not. So these are complicated questions, and Jeff's exactly right. These are driven by very localized issues. Uh, the Hispanic communities in New Mexico are different whether you're in southern Mexico, or whether you're in Santa Fe. In Santa Fe, the, a lot of the people who would be classified as Hispanics don't really consider themselves Hispanic. They consider themselves Spanish. Uh, and their, and their, their family came over in, you know, 1564 or whatever to Santa Fe, and, and they don't believe, and they often are not, politically arrived, uh, aligned with with more recent arrivals in La Cruces, who are, who are closer to Mexico uh, culturally than they are. So it's a complicated issue uh, that one size does not fit all. Yeah, and one other issue that the Supreme Court may eventually hear in the next few years is whether the Voting Rights Act requires uh, coalition districts. You know, right now, if you have a Voting Rights Act violation situation, you have to show you have to demonstrate that a single minority group, whether it's Black or Hispanic or Asian, would constitute 50%, that's 50% period, not 49%, of a minority uh, district 
And if you can't reach that <clears throat> single race 50% threshold, then you are not required to create a new minority district. But the test will come this decade whether you are required to combine or you could combine, let's say, Black and Hispanic voters uh, into one district. Uh, the Supreme Court has not ruled on that point. It has ruled in a case called Bartlett versus Strickland that 50 percent of one race is required, whether 50 percent of multi races are required is something I think the court will visit uh, sometime in the next few years. I think Jeff's exactly right. There is something of a circuit split on this issue, uh, but I certainly hope and expect, maybe more hope than expect, I never know, me predicting what the Supreme Court will do has not necessarily been, you know, something mm -hmm. I would have won a lot of money <laughs> on yeah. getting at, at the MGM. But I, I think given the circuit split, this is an issue that we hope the Supreme Court will address sooner rather than later for all of us who are advising line drawers. Yeah, and this is an issue that you know, Virginia, as an example, is debating uh, whether coalition districts are required. Uh, the Democrats seem to favor that, whereas the Republicans are against that. Not that they're against it in principle, simply you're not, you could create those districts, but you're not required to create those districts. So we have a question. Um, how would you prove that different minority groups in a coalition district are cohesive? Do you rely on primary election results or general, general election results? You yes. have to. Yeah, mark <laughs> yes. Okay. Both of you say both. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, you, you, you have to use both to get there. You can't, uh, yeah, uh, you, it's hard to identify the candidate of choice. Um, and it, as an example, it's hard to identify the candidate of choice of the black community simply looking at general election data, because I can tell you 99% of the time in the general election is simply going to be the Democratic nominee. That doesn't tell you whether or not the Democratic nominee is necessarily really the candidate of choice of the minority community. You might have to look at the primary to determine that. Yeah. And, and that goes trying to identify you know, which, you know, groups coalesce with other ones involve. There's a variety of different statistical techniques, retrogression analysis, ecological inferences and things like that, which are, are interesting. Some, sometimes I understand how they're done. Sometimes I don't seem to understand how they're done. So there are a lot of ways statistically to look at it. But even with sophisticated statistics, it can be difficult sometimes to make those determinations. Yeah, yeah, Mark is right. What you have to do, this is one of the hardest selling points I've had to make, although more jurisdictions I'm working with are coming around this decade, is that you have to undertake you know, classic racially polarized voting analysis, which means you've got to build a database of election results looking at every primary and general election for generally a 10 year period and then bring in a qualified court-tested political scientist, Bernie Groffman is probably the, um, the leading one in the country to mm -hmm. analyze the data. And that data is going to tell you whether you know, Smithtown or Jonesville has racially polarized voting and whether 48% or 55% minority voting age population is needed to elect the minority community's preferred candidate, not necessarily a minority candidate, her or himself, but the preferred candidate. And that's done by looking at these primaries and general elections where a white candidate uh, ran against a black, Hispanic, Asian uh, American candidate. Without that kind of analysis, it's a guessing game. And too many jurisdictions uh, in the last 10 years lost their, uh, their, their, their court challenges because they didn't do that kind of a homework. You can look at uh, North Carolina, Virginia, Alabama, you know, as, as examples in the recent few years. It just takes a few thousand dollars or more, about a month's worth of time, but you have to get that basic homework done. Otherwise, it's a partisan, don't bring uh, you know, a, a, a knife to a gunfight. You have to have the right tools and homework done. So the, the Congress is also considering um, uh, other legislation um, on uh, the Voting Rights Act. Um, the Senate has a Freedom to Vote Act. 
um, which is has differences um, from the John R. Lewis Act and um, some elements of the For the People Act. So how, how would that impact uh, redistricting if it, that were to move in the, in yeah, the Congress? How things might impact redistricting at this point depends if these bills, any bills get through the Congress. Uh, the uh, S-1 bill was, uh, they couldn't get the votes to bring it up in the Senate. Um, Senator Manchin was first opposed. Now Senator Manchin from West Virginia has come back with a compromise that would essentially set new standards against partisan gerrymandering. So that bill, the intent is that regardless of when Congress passes it, any redistricting plan uh, can be challenged in court even after they're enacted for you know, a period of years looking backwards. But uh, there's no federal law at this point outside of the Voting Rights Act, the 14th Amendment, and the equal uh, population requirement that federal law uh, you know, has jurisdiction over. They're, they're really, it's really left to state and local laws, but uh, they're, they're, you know, the current bill, uh, S-1, or its current iteration in the Senate, would create a wholly new standard for giving courts more power to uh, reject redistricting plans based on partisan grounds. That bill has not gained traction yet. There's still partisan gerrymandering as a cause of action as we speak right now in federal court is pretty much dead. Uh, there's, I guess you can dream up some way that it would be alive in some context, but not much in federal court. That does not, though, mean that it's dead in state courts. There, Pennsylvania, as the perfect example, has decided that their state constitution, in, in what is basically a 180 degree change of their past jurisprudence, uh, has a you know a, a provision that would you know have support a claim under partisan concepts of gerrymandering. To some degree, you see the same thing in North Carolina. My guess is that there may be other states uh, where in the state court system, you'll see those claims. In fact, you almost certainly will see those claims. More difficult question is whether they'll be successful or not. I think if you have a conservative court in your state, it's unlikely, frankly, it doesn't matter who drew the plan, whether R's or D's, a conservative court is unlikely to entertain partisan gerrymandering litigation in in most states. So yeah, a more liberal just, court, maybe. If I could just close, in 1946, the U.S. Supreme Court in Caldwell versus Green said, Justice Frankfurter's words, stay out of the political thicket of redistricting. 1961, uh, 62 rather, uh, Justice Brennan comes back and tells us, Baker v. Carr, uh, this is all justiciable. Uh, come 2019, Chief Justice Roberts tells us no partisan gerrymandering cases in this building. Come back in 20 to 40 years and see what happens. Hmm. Any last words? Uh, equal time, uh, Mr. Braden. <laughs> <laughs> no? Well, I can tell you one thing for sure. Uh, there are a lot of thorns in the political thicket, uh, which uh, might not be good for the country. They're really good for the lawyers. <laughs> We are very, very busy, Jeff and myself and, and our comrades here, because the law remains, even after years, quite murky. Yeah. Uh, well, well, on behalf of uh, the Federalist Society um, uh, Free Speech and Election Law Executive Committee, thank you both so much for joining us. So we've, I'm sure you guys could chat with us for much longer. Um, and so but thank you so much for your time. Well, thank um, you. Thank you. Great, thanks very much. I'll just add my thanks and the thanks to the Federalist Society, to our panelists, to our moderator, and to our audience for participating and sending in your questions. We welcome listener feedback by email at info at fed-soc.org. So if you have comments or any other comments, please send them there. And in the meantime, thanks very much. We are adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>